Hello amateurs, welcome to another episode of the Amateur Rugby Podcast, here to help soothe your Sunday morning hangover with some wonderful rugby chat about the grassroots of the game. I'm your host Tim and I've got another fantastic guest for you today. This man is still playing at age 48, same age as me. He's now taken the field with both of his sons and he's been part of an incredible rugby clubhouse design and build at Mitchin Hampton RFC. Please welcome Mr Andy Burford. Andy, how are you? Not too bad, buddy. Yourself? Very well. Very well this morning. Now then, let's talk about your current playing status. As I mentioned in the intro, we're the same age. I hung my boots up quite some time ago, but but you're still going. So tell me about that. What's it feel like and, and why do you still lace them up? Well, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, I've been at the club playing, back playing. I took a gap, got into my 20s, took a gap and sort of got roped back in and sort of my sort of early 30s to start playing. So I'm 48, still running out for the seconds when I can, ideally just a half. But we, as we know, with um, um, numbers in the, in the amateur game, <clears throat> It, uh, it quite often turns into a full 80. Um, so, yeah, I'm playing up here, uh, second row, occasionally, I'll, I'll use the term loosely, utility back, um, uh, back row, sorry, I'm not back. Um, and it's, 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 for me, <clears throat> it's all about being part of something. It's, um, and like you say, I've, when in the intro, recently got to play with both of my sons at the same time. Well, the eldest one started back, um, totally novice. The boys at the club welcomed him, and he's he's straight into it. And he's now, after two and a half, three seasons up with the first team, um, so he's doing all right for himself. It does help. He's he's six foot six and about uh, 15, 16 stone, so he's an absolute dream in the lineup for them. Um, and then after a gap of about three or four years, the youngest one decided he wanted to come back. Um, so it's, um, you know, I'm getting a chance to share that experience of being on the field at the same time with both of them, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, but yeah, that's yeah, the main tell me sort more of... about that. What's it like to run out with, with your lads and, and sort of be on the pitch at the same time? Just give me some more detail around that. It's, it's, it's an interesting one. I know, I know there's plenty of others have done it. There was that chap, I can't remember which club he was from. I think it was him and his family made up the whole packet. I think he was on hitting all the socials some, some months ago. It, but it is an interesting thing. It's, it's pride. It's, it's a sense of pride. And um, as you say, a lot of blokes give up the game mid to late 30s and don't get that opportunity. So it is an apt... Uh, Plasnet is a bit of an achievement, I feel. Um, and yeah. the youngest one was a little bit reluctant to play. Um, but he decided that, he, you know, he wanted to emulate his brother and get out with the old man. And it's... Uh, but then the funny thing is the, the protective side kicks in as well. Um, you know, it's uh, I'm, I'm not the most aggressive or confrontational bloke on the pitch by any means. But when you know it's um, when you know it's your son on there, you just the old parental thing kicks in. But you learn to control that, and they got to learn to fight their own battles. Um, but he, no, he's he's loving it. Fair play to him, the youngest one. He's come back in, really taking to it, and sort of really getting involved. Um, but so her fingers crossed, long may it continue. And then the next plan um, is to promote my lad, the oldest one from the first to the second, get him promoted down to us. And then we'll get all three of us on the pitch at the same time. So, yeah, it's it, yeah, it, that'll it, be very... amazing. Yeah. So, uh, just want to pick up on something you mentioned there about when your eldest son started up as a, as a newbie and how the club kind of helped him. Uh, sort of brought him in and, and sort of upskilled him. I've witnessed that myself several times, especially at junior clubs. Just talk to me about that process and, and how the rugby club was sort of supported him in, in his goals. Oh, it, to be honest, it, it, every as he was he's a big at the time he was quite a, just a big tall streak of nothing, um, and he stopped playing when he was ten. Uh, decided to return just after he turned eighteen, and. There was only one place he was going to end up, and that was going to be in the pack somewhere, cause it, just because of his size. But the, I can remember bringing him up the first session, and he must have got a bit peed off with it, to be honest, because he had about fifteen coaches all teaching him the art of scrumming from the front row to the to myself in the second row and and some of the back rows, and he just got stuck in, and you know he's filled out a bit over time, and 
getting stronger as he gets older. Um, but the environment, every each and every one of the lads, you know, even to the if he hadn't played for sort of eight, nine, ten years like he hadn't, to come in and start being chucked up in the air just because he's six foot six is a quite a feat. But everyone took him time. You know, we got a cracking setup of the club with, um, like most clubs, a very really good director of rugby who looked after him and very knowledgeable. But um, lots of armchair experts and coaches. Um, but it, uh, it really is a. It makes you realise what the game's all about when you see that they're going to they're willing to encompass a, essentially a complete novice. Yeah, and the the thing you put, picked up there, I think, is probably one of the things that people underestimate what it feels like to be thrown up in the air as a line out jumper and be all the way up there you feel like you're very unsupported you feel like you're very unstable and then you've got to get your way back down finding the confidence to do that is not a small thing um so tell me a bit more about that andy what do you think there well it's not um it's not a skill i've ever been mastered i'm just too too big and heavy to be chucked up in the air i think you'd need a high ab to get me up there but it's um it's it was just teaching him and, and we do it all with the kids in the club and and we've got a very good women's section now. It's just teaching them to have that confidence to get up, get up straight, you know, the old up and powerful and leap and trust your lifters. Um, and it does go wrong. We've all, you know, we've all dropped someone at some point or the other, or um, you get a collision and it goes wrong. But it's giving people that confidence to get up there. I can remember training some of the kids once and, we had a tall lad and he threw this kid up and he must have been seven foot in the air by the time he finished. And the poor kid was absolutely, uh, you know, petrified. But then they start to love it and the adrenaline kicks in and you can't... It's just, and you watch them doing it at the international level now where they're grabbing them by the shins and chucking them even higher and letting them go. Now that is a feat. Um, but it is a an amazing skill. And it's got to be a confidence thing as well, trusting your teammates. You've got to trust that bloke who's got your back of your shorts or your, you know, your thighs or whatever it is. And you've got to be really trusting. So it's all good skills for them. Yeah, completely. And, and you're right. I think everybody's dropped somebody at some point, but you do tend to just find a way to catch them on the way down, you know, sort of lessen yeah. the fall a little bit somehow. Somebody will, somebody will catch you. Don't worry if you're a jumper yeah. and you're thrown up we'll there. We'll break into the, the ball somehow. <laughs> yeah. hopefully, um, hopefully it's one of the opposition underneath you, but. <laughs> um, Let's rewind a little bit, Andy. Talk to me about that time when you came back into the game, when you got roped back in, as you as you phrased it. What was that period like for you? And what, why did you sort of jump back in and get involved? It's, it's an interesting one. because I, I played throughout school and I remember the memory of always being quite a big lump. Um, I can remember my first day of high school PE, never having played before. Because where when I grew up in Cardiff, the... Um, Unless you went to a Catholic school, you didn't play rugby until you went to secondary school. Um, so we're rocking up on your first day of secondary school. The games teacher's handing out the uniform. He looks, do you play rugby? And then, no, sir, I don't. He said, well, you do now, so you haven't got any choice. And then so played played all the way through secondary school um, and then played until probably about 2021. 20, I had to stop then for work reasons, just couldn't give the time up on the weekends. And then um, when my eldest was started nursery in Minch, Minch and Hampton, I was stood there at the nursery gate and one of the dads said, oh, do you play? Well, we got chatting. I said, no, I don't. He said, well, we, I'm at the club. We've got a touch rugby section. Just come up and do a bit of fitness on a Thursday night. So I went into the cupboard and dug out my boots. And I, you'll probably remember them because they're a similar age. The old forward boots with the big high ankles on them. Yeah. And I dug those up. They hadn't been worn for probably 15 years. I think the leather was just holding on for dear life. <laughs> and uh, chucked those on, went up to this touch section this touch game, which was just basically a muddy field, our, our original site, uh, played for two hours, absolutely ruined me the next day. Because, t- you know, touch rugby as much as, you know, it is actually quite a physical sport. And and then that went on for about six months. And then, then comes the magical, oh, we got a thirds game on the weekend. Do you fancy it? And I think it was the f- then, if my memory serves me right, this would have been about 2007-ish, 2008. First game of rugby I played in probably 15-odd years. Um, it's the first time the club had put out the thirds in about 13 years. And uh, so we rock up, and I, then I get the fateful call, have you ever played front row? <laughs> now, as, as you, I, I think you're a front row, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
it's a dark, dark place of mysterious things going on in there. Um, and so I ended up front row. There was me never having played front row, not played for 15 years. An 18-year-old kid from the local private school who'd been roped in to help us. And our then um, club um, president, who God rest his soul, who at the time was just turning 60 in the front row. So we get to this front row and first scrum, back arches. Next thing I know, I've popped three ribs off the cartilage and I'm in a whole world of discomfort and pain. Um, I thought, well, that's it. I'm not playing this stupid game ever again. Sod it. You know, it's... Um, and that, so once the ribs healed after about two or three months, it's, well, come and have another go. <laughs> so I rock up on a Saturday afternoon after after a night shift, sort of half delirious through tiredness. And um, the rest is history. Just playing for the seconds, rocked up, had a bit of fun. And at the time, we didn't have the club then. We were, um, for want of a better phrase, a homeless club. And um, the rest is history. And I've been playing then, started playing on and off, played. Um, Predominantly second team rugby, occasionally first team rugby, then not very much. Probably had about, I don't know, about five or six games for the first team, but just a different level beyond me, as especially as at this point I would have been knocking on late 30s. Um, and then ever since then, I've stayed playing um, second team rugby all the way through. And then you get roped into, like most rugby clubs, you get roped into the volunteering and the execs and the committees and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, the rest of it is just sort of history. So 16 years I've been here, it's been an absolute blur. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, fair play to you for, for getting back in, firstly, and then popping ribs in your first game back and then still getting back again. That's um, that's remarkable. Well done for that. Um, Thank you, man. Tell me a little bit more about the whole roping in process, because, I mean, it'll be familiar to rugby clubs up and down the land, all over the place, at very at hugely different levels as well, all the way up to some quite high levels. You still get this feeling of, you know, having to get a team out and having to sort of ring round and get players. <clears throat> What's that like at Kitchen Apton at the moment? Is that still the case? It's well, if you, it, it, I ran the second team for a season as captain um, and... It's a lot easier now than I think it was back in the day. If you talk to some of the old boys, now the oldest guy playing here, we got a 64. Um, and he's been here since the club started. And he talks of the days of having a list of names and all that, being in the pub on a Friday night, making an emergency phone call to come on with five people short. And I think, you know, obviously phones and messaging and what have you, it's a lot easier. Um, and you've got obviously got apps that you can sign up on. Um, but you never miss an opportunity to sign someone up. Um, I drive the wife nuts, to be honest. We'll go to a party, I get chatting to someone, they find out how to play, and, he, and you just look at them and you go, fancy a game Saturday? Do you want, do you want to play? You know, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's about keeping the game alive at this level. As you, uh, you know, and, um, and I'm sure it's the same all over the country. We're struggling, and it's getting the guys in, it's getting them involved, and those that we have recruited seem to love it, and uh, we get the guys coming in. Uh, we had a game just gone on the weekend, a league game, and one of the coaches hadn't played again for 10, 15 years. And the smile on his face when he came back after that game, phenomenal. You know, you, could, you couldn't buy it. Yeah, on it's seat. a funny thing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Like, it's, there's, there's this kind of reticence to play. There's this kind mm. of, it feels like a big commitment to sort of get the boots on and get out there. But yeah. the vast majority, vast, vast majority, that when they do, they love it and they want to play again as soon as possible. It is, it is like I said, it's, it's almost like a legal high. When I, the feeling you get off that, coming off after a really good game, you're, in, you're having a few beers, you're you know, having a chat with the guys. And um, the thing I'd say to anyone that's thinking about it, whether it's Minch or wherever it is or over the country, just give it a go. Rock up. If you can't train every week, explain that you can't do it and you just want a social game. And most clubs will be welcome you with open arms, you know, unless you're getting up to the sort of higher levels. But the grassroots where we are, I think if, you, if you're willing just and just straight people, look, I only want one or two games a month and just do that. It's the best thing ever. Really do. Yeah, you're dead right there. I think almost every club would, would take you with open arms and, and sort of give you a game and, and welcome you into the fold. I've certainly witnessed that in many, many places around the country. Okay. <laughs> 
yeah. let's talk about the clubhouse itself. We've alluded to it a little bit already. And uh, for people that don't know, why don't you tell people exactly where you are right now? So I am sat, you can just about see behind me. Um, that is our pulpit, and I'll explain that shortly. But I'm sat right in the clubhouse at the moment. Um, we bought the site in about 2015. It's just some Arab, um, farmland that came up for sale. Uh, and then we went through a sort of two-year process to get the land converted and uh, from farmland to pitches with a lot of help from the RFU. Um, and everything we've done up here has tried to be, because we're quite a rural club. We're, in, we're just sort of out in the um, south of the Cotswolds, outside Stroud. Um, but it's, uh, you've seen the building, Tim, you know it's, you think you're coming up to a barn, wouldn't you? It's a sort of, um, it, we, we wanted to go for a, a structure that fitted in with where we are, the rural surrounding. Um, and we're very lucky. Uh, the, the then first team captain was a, is a very good local architect who's done some fabulous work, Matty Austin. Um, and he came up with this design and it, it is, it's, it's functional, it's rustic. And it's, uh, it's essentially a cross between a church hall and a barn. More, probably more barn, I would say. Um, everything's, um, so you can see the pulpit behind us. And, um, that was the idea of uh, a couple of the older boys who decided that we needed somewhere to give our post-match uh, entertainment and speeches. So bless them, a few of them took it upon themselves to drive up to Scotland after buying it for 600 quid on eBay. Um, oh, really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> And they had, a, a, I think it was an excuse for an overnighter. Um, <laughs> and they, they, they came back with that thing and everyone comes in. We've had people coming in actually thinking it is a church. It's, it's quite fun, but there's nothing better after, an, you know, after a Saturday afternoon getting up to do the, the amount of the match and the other awards that you do give out. Um, but the whole thing has been built predominantly, give or say a few specialist trades, by people involved in the club. Um, the second team captain, Fraze, he was, um, he's a guy that built the built the structure. Um, so it's all been a massive com sort of volunteer led community effort. We've paid people, obviously people got lives and mortgages to pay, but it's all been done through volunteers. And, you know, we turned this, turned around a fabulous building for what a good, you know, not as much as it could have been if we'd done it properly. Uh, sorry, that sounds terrible. If we'd done it, <laughs> if we'd had, the, no offense to Fraser, he is a qualified builder. If we'd done it with, um, you know, sort it out to trades, but it is what it is. It's, you know, and we try and be quirky about it. There's no point. We didn't want to be, um, there's no offence to any of the rugby clubs, we didn't want to be a concrete block thing on the outskirts of a city. You, I'll send it, you know, get some links over for the podcast and you can you can see what we are. We're a, we're a timber-clad barn. Yeah, I'm going to... I'm going to overlay some photos onto the onto the video here for people to watch it on YouTube, and I'll put some photos on the blog post as well on the website, so that everybody can have a look. But when I turned the corner, I visited on the Great Rugger Run last year, so I've just run twelve miles or whatever, and I'd like right, here, okay, it was like the hundred and twenty seventh rugby club I'd visited in the last month or something, and to turn around and look at this amazing structure i was like what even is that like i was like okay well that's another building somewhere the rugby club will be must be somewhere else and it's remarkable like it looks so so beautiful and so fit for its setting as you mentioned no so that's kind of you to say it's um and you know that day you did come up because you'd had a nice day the day before down with our, our um down on our, our local team at Dan kane's cross i know you had a really nice welcome from them um and you came around and it just it's it's when you actually get there and you think uh, I could see your face when I was showing you around. It was just like, is this really a club? It was quite odd. It, um, yeah, yeah it's, it's, unique is the phrase I'll probably use. Definitely unique, and also like uh, you, you get a feel for it from what we can see through the screen here. But it's such a warm and sort of uh, friendly and welcoming sort of site inside with the open fire and the kitchen by the side. Well, we got, just tell me a little so, bit more about those. So we've got the fireplace. Um, I say I'll chuck you some photos to um, and check up on the um, podcast. Um, the fireplace is a wood burner that we put in on a concrete stand. Behind that, then we've got a wall of tiles that we use for um, donations that people, and they got the names up there. You know, 
there's not many rugby clubs in the kitchen in the country that have got an arga to cook on. Um, and that's again, that's a local thing. They got one of the guys that we um play with runs a plumbing company, Mark Pollard, and he he, he refurbishes these argas. And he said, let's put it in. Why not? It's unique. Sometimes it's it's um it's a bit of a challenge to cook a a big meal after a match, but again, it just, it just settles that different side of it. Plus, it heats the club when it's hot in the winter. So it does get quite fresh up here, right up on top of the Cotswolds. Yeah, hundred percent. What what else? What else is in the clubhouse? What else is unique? Because I remember there were quite a few. So uh, we've um, kind of pieces. well, we got just looking up now. We've got a chandelier made out of um, raw iron and wine bottles, um, <laughs> right in the middle of the clubhouse that was um, sort of lit up with LEDs, which looks quite effective on a on a sort of a winter's evening. Um, and I think the main thing we're sort of looking at at the moment that sort of gets everyone. I know you've done a piece on it, is the ref's changing room. Now, that is something um, different. There's not there's not many, a lot of the local refs are used to us now. Um, but it's, uh, we've had a ref come down, I can't remember her name, She uh, but she's quite a type drop, um, top flight ref in the uh, women's game. And she was just like, oh my God, what is this place? And it, it's been done. Um, how can I best describe it? Uh, so a group of the guys got together quietly away from the committee. So they didn't get in trouble. <laughs> and within about two weeks, they turned what you know should be just a concrete floor and a couple of benches into something similar to your grandma's front room. Um, there's a nice leather armchair. There's um, uh, drinks, those sort of um, globe drink servers. Um, I, we just added a, a collection of last of the summer wine memorabilia plates on the wall. Um, <laughs> There's some proper stuff in there. And I think the key, you know, it's um, just a little bit of fun and what the game's all about. You walk in because it's the ref's room. The ref gets the key and it's on the end of a white stick. Um, and then his first thing he sees is the sight chart right in front of him. But just a little bit of fun. And most of the refs are, well, I've never, I've not heard anything negative about it, mate. It's been really good. Really good. Yeah. it's It shows so much about the character of your club and the people that are within it. And as you said, I, when I was there, I was like, right, I've got to film this. I've got to capture this. Um, so I've created a, a sh- short video, which I'll link as well in the description of, the, of of this show so people can go and see it because it's just so beautifully done. And it just, for me, it really encapsulates what rugby is all about. It's a bit of fun. It's a bit of cheeky, but it just puts a smile on people's faces, I think. Well, it does. And, you know, even down to the, um, the original set of change rooms we got to be extended about two years ago now. The local church was having a big refurb, so we got all the pews out of there. And you go in the first two change rooms, you're sitting on church pews that have probably shouldn't be associated with rugby. Some of the antics going on in the changing rooms, but um, yeah, it's it's just about just trying to make things different, really. And the big thing, you know, um, there's a theme running through the club where our post-match dress code is tweed. You have to wear tweed, and um, really, it's every, it's every week. Every week, um, it's a tweed jacket. No. Um, Drive some of the other local clubs a bit nuts, but we don't let, you know, denim is forbidden. Um, it has to be chinos, ties and tweed, um, unless it's a particularly warm day. And then we'll call a what we call surf and turf, which is um, Hawaiian shirts, shorts and tweed. So it's, um, it, yeah, we do look like we run through a charity shop some days, but it's, um, it is just part of our, our sort of slightly uh, different outtake on the game. Yeah, that's amazing. Oh, anything else, Andy? Anything else about what you do there and, and, and how you run things? Because it just sounds like there's probably some more things there that I'm not aware of yet. Um, the main thing we're trying to do, and we've always prided on it, is um, the club values and the game values. We've had a massive, massive drive on that. Not that we had an issue, but I think if you keep on top of things, and there was a few little habits creeping in perhaps from other pitch side behaviour, Pitch, on the pitch and off the pitch. And we've, we've had a massive drive on that. And we're just trying to make the club as a friendly and as a warm place it can be, inclusive. You know, in the last two years, we've gone from not having a women's team to 30 women who've now just entered the NC3 League and loving it. And we've got women rocking up there that have never played at all. Just find it on the social media and go, boom, give it a whirl, and they turn up, and they're loving it. So our main thing is just trying to make people welcome and get people into the game. Yeah, brilliant. And and the women's side in particular, like I'm a, a big fan of that. That it's hugely growing so fast. How did you get started? What was sort of the driver for you as a club 
to get a women's section going? Uh, well, we it sort of evolved from the girls' section because we obviously were taking um, girls in through the junior game up until age ten, and when they go into the con, uh, I think they do one season of contact. Um, so it sort of evolved from there. Then some of the older girls wanted to get involved, um, and we've had a, a chap come in, um, Tom Nurse, who's um, involved with the GRFU, and he stepped the team up. Um, and it literally was, I think we had eight or nine, and it was just, let's see where this goes. And it's built and it's built. We've got dragging a few people in from other clubs. Like you say, the women's game has exploded in popularity. You know, we um, you, you only have to look at the weekend. You know, I think someone said there was 48,000 up at Twickenham watching the Red Roses. Um, um, as it is now, we got, uh, we're very lucky. We got some very good coaches up there in um, who are passing on what they've learned. We got uh, what the one guy who's played prop for us, and he's taking on the lead role at the coaching now. Uh, and another guy who's coached rugby all his life, Andy Nash, and has played some good rugby. Um, so it's, the buzz around the women's section is phenomenal. They literally they're turning up. We had two girls rock up last week um, who've never played. Actually, saw something on Instagram, contacted us, said, "Can I, we come along?" They did. And as it happens, we the team was training for their first game just gone on the weekend against local Fairford, and these two girls just sat there, never didn't know anything about rugby, but just got involved. Learned, you know, just said, just watch. They're doing some team runs. You might not get it all, but we can move on from that in a few weeks' time when when you come back. And it's it's, it's amazing to see. It really is. So, yeah, it's a. I think it changes what you what rugby clubs used to be, isn't it? It used to be obviously a very male dominated space, and and it's not like that anymore in many places. And I think that's for the benefit of everybody, in my opinion. No, to- absolutely, totally. You know, we the one thing we've um, strived for is to make the women's team feel on a par with the men's senior team. Uh, make sure that they're involved in everything. Um, that they get their fair share, fair share of the kit, and it's got to be it's got to be equal. They're giving up their time to come and be at the club, so let's make things equal. And it's changing the club. And as I said, Minch has always been a very welcoming, inclusive club. But we don't. Um, I've not seen any problems. I've not yet any gripes or grumbles about you know what you might expect from some traditionally male environments. We just don't get it. And it's so it's so nice to see. And like I say we're. I think we're over 30, 30 women signed up on the books now, which is amazing. Yeah, fabulous. I mean, rugby clubs are one of the most welcoming places on the planet, really, generally. So that's that's great to hear. Now then, let's move on to the next subject. And Minchin Hampton might be a familiar name to many more people than it was maybe a few years ago due to a slightly famous player that you've got playing there. So tell me all about uh, your royal connection and, and what he brings to the club. Well, you're obviously talking about Mr. Tyndall. So he rocked up again um, probably about five, six years ago and because we're literally just across the road from Gatcombe where his mother-in-law lives. And um, he sort of messaged someone, said, could you just come over and use the fields for a bit of training and fitness? I said, yeah, by all means, crack on. Um, why don't you come along and, again, a bit like, uh, you know, come and have a go at the touch rugby with us and see where you go. <laughs> so he started coming along to the touch. He did a couple of the, the touch sessions, and then a, the and fair play, he signed up. He um, he's got himself involved. Uh, and if you look at his um, if when he's doing like his after dinner speaking and things like that, he puts his club as Gloucester's Bath Lions England and at the bottom Minchin Hampton, which is and he's been a really good ambassador for the club. In all fairness, he promote he's promoted us on his podcast, The Good, The Bad, and Rugby. You know, we'll quite often they'll do um. They did a session a couple of years back where it was gratuitous drug. He, he rocked up with a shirt on. He was drinking out of a minch mug. And, um, you know, it's we're very fortunate to have that connection. Um, you know, there's other clubs that got, uh, you know, there's a piece on the, um, about Gavin Henson turning out for Pencoid down in South Wales last, um, over the weekend. And they had their biggest ever crowd or something. And it does attract. It does attract. Um, his first game was against um, Haynes Cross. Where you stopped off, um, and I don't think Kings Cross have ever seen such a big crowd around that park. Um, but he, he's very good. He plays. He does play well, and he plays hard. But he, you know, he doesn't sometimes unleash the full um, 
international mood. Yeah, it's only fair, isn't it? It's only fair. Um, but he does seem like uh, he's got a really good sort of old school attitude to these things. And uh, he loves playing for playing's sake itself. Um, is, is that is that correct? Is that what I'm seeing? Yeah, right? he settled in very well. And, you know, we sat in the, after the one game, he sat in the pub with us and we were all singing some songs and um, sort of he, he was he was getting involved in it all. You know, he, he, he we had a fun day up here over the summer and he rocked up with um, Zara and the kids and had a burger and, uh, and sort of mingled with people. So he, he loves that grassroots environment. And he's a bit like yourself. It's all about promoting the game uh, and any opportunity he gets, you know, we'll quite often get a name drop on the podcast, um, which is, and, it, and obviously his status has gone, exploded over the years, hasn't it? With the celebrity game show and all that sort of thing. So yeah, it's not done us any harm. It's not done the game any harm, which is brilliant because he does promote getting involved. But it would be fairly remiss of me not to comment on some of the other homegrown talent that we produced ourselves. Um, we've got a very good touch section at the club, um, uh, ranging through all age, good touch rugby section, ranging from all age groups. And we've recently had one uh, one of the young women from there, Eva Artingsall. She just represented England under 18s. Um, uh, at the European Touch, which they won, which was an absolutely amazing achievement, and also doing regional development through the Wildcats Touch program. So fair play to her. We've had a couple of years back. We had another World Cup winner playing Touch at the club for a couple of seasons. A lady by the name of Joe McGilchrist, who was in the England and uh, sorry England um, World Cup winning team two thousand and ten. So it's um, he's not the only one in the club, but we, we're doing all right on it. And again. I, I, I shouldn't really finish this section without mentioning um, the young lad that we've had who's been through the club all the way from minis and juniors. Um, and he's, he's worked his way through to the club and he's been picked up by Gloucester, uh, Ewan Jones. Of course, he's um, a quality lad, quality player. Bit of a shame he's not playing for Wales, but um, you know, I'd rather you know rather Minch was getting promoted somewhere than not at all. Um, and he's now in the England Under-20 World Champions. So, as it goes, Mr Tins has brought a lot to us, um, but hopefully there's a line of future stars there that could be improving things for us all around. Um, we had, I don't know if you saw the prison drama they did, um, prison documentary they did. I haven't seen it, no. No, so uh, last summer, him, Delalio and Phil Vickery and a few others went into a prison. And... Um, they were trying to use rugby as a uh, intervention to prevent people offending and things like that. I mean, and I think it's something Delalio was doing an awful lot of through his charity work. Um, and they wanted to show the families of the, some of the guys they had on the team what it was like to be part of a rugby club and what they could get out of it. And so they came from all over the region and the country and they came up here for an evening and we had a training session and a barbecue and just chatting to the families. So and it, hopefully that will then give the families the reason to encourage these guys coming out of prison, that there's something outside of life that they can get them, you know, maybe turn their lives around a bit with, find different distractions. Yeah, that's amazing. So um, so you ran that there at Minch, and, and what was the reception? You know, what what feedback were you kind of getting from some of these families? Well, it was interesting because they were, they were here for a good three or four hours, and if you watch it, I think it was a two or three-part documentary. There was about 30 seconds of us in the barbecue in the end by the time they edited it down. But a lot of the families loved it. They really did. And we got chatting to the end of one of them. And the one guy was from Bristol Way. And um, again, this is where the game's great. Um, we were able to put him in, put their family in touch with a local club down there. So when he does come out, there's a name and a number. And through contacts that we know down there, we said, this guy's going to hopefully come down in a few months' time or whatever it is. Please make sure he's welcome. And they, I don't know what's happened to that. I'll have to try and follow it up. But um, it's all it's, it's amazing if we can if we can change one person's life through the game, whether it's an adult or a child, whatever it is, then brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. That I mean, that's a brilliant way. Uh, just a great example of like the rugby family and how that all works together. And you know, you're one club, but you're one club as part of the big, the whole big rugby club in the world. And like you say, if you can help one family or one person just by a little bit of outreach like that, then so much power to you. Well, it, it, it is, and even like when you did your run last was it last year, wasn't it? It was um, yeah. 
and obviously the MND thing's been quite big in the game with Doddy and Rob Burrows and um, Ed over at Gloucester. It's the sort of the, I can remember sitting the other, uh, we were watching one of the um, Six Nations and it was the day that Doddy passed and there was just a hush quiet over the club. Everyone was properly, it actually hit people. None of us ever met him, none of us knew him, but it's that rugby connection, it's that rugby family. And that's why the game is, is so good for looking after each other. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, what a brilliant way to end that part of the show and we'll move on to the stash section now, Andy. So, it's my favourite part. Which uh, which is your favourite bit of stash that you've ever received? Oh, wow. Uh, when I when you sort of gave me the preempt of what we might be looking at, I had to start racking my brains because I've... Uh, it's, it's quite an odd one. I it must have been about 20-odd and I was um, seen as a a physio down in Cardiff and I didn't realise at the time he's a very good physio. Um, I just kept sort of having problems with my ankles. And it turns out he was the physio for the barbarians. <laughs> and I was there one day doing the session. He said, Oh, could you jump on the treadmill? And I was in jeans. Uh, he, said, he said, Well, put these on. He gave me this pair of shorts and it must have been Canterbury shorts or something. And uh, it turns out they were player shorts from the game. I was 20 years old, thinking I was God's gift to rugby. Um, <laughs> These things, I wore them to death, <laughs> literally till, till, literally till the, uh, the. I think they fell off me one day in a tackle or something like that. But nothing special, but just that little connection to the game and the senior stuff. Um, the stash, everyone loves a bit of stash, don't they? It's um, yeah. And what, what we, you know, we we're trying to find a balance at the club of what we do with stash, and then everyone that signs up and each season we do a different diff, different bit of stash. Um, some horrendous. Well, it's not horrendous. I really like it—a pink Hawaiian floral sh- rugby shirt. Um, but yeah, I think those those shorts are just quite odd. I'm not a great one for stash because a lot of it never fits me. But um, it, uh, yeah, those shorts were one of my favourites. I think. Or well, the well, other one, I suppose. Great... Back in '99 World Cup, um, yeah, it was in Cardiff, and I was da- and there was a Guinness were doing a promotion where you could get a. Guinness rugby shirt was white on the top, like a pint of Guinness, and black on the bottom. And, every, and a lot of the pubs were giving them out. I managed to get my hands on one of them. That, that sort of got quite a bit of, um, not even cred, but quite a bit of kudos in the pub that night when I rocked up with that. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, it's a great story behind those shorts. And also, the fact that you wore them to death, I think everybody listening to this will be think of some piece of kit that they've had in the past, which they loved so much that they just wore it until it literally fell off them. So that's brilliant. Okay, yeah. next question. What is your favourite kit of all time? So this can be any team from any oh. era. Now, I, I did have to have a good thinking cap on that. I remember years ago, I had, um, they're not, they were Cardiff then, not now obviously Cardiff Blues. And they used to have a, a black and white top and about would have been about 94, 95. And I loved that. And it got lost in a house move and I never saw it again. Oh. But I always, think, I always think about it. I looked it up last night just when you said about it. And uh, I did find one online. I just thought, oh, probably living in the past a bit. But that was always one of my favourite. <laughs> oh, you were thinking about maybe buying another one, were you? But yeah. I thought, obviously, there's these people online doing the vintage ones and oh do it don't do because as much as um obviously the technology and the fabrics moved on in shirts you can't beat an old-fashioned shirt that gets heavier as it gets wet and things like that <laughs> yeah absolutely now talking about things moving on is there any awful kits around at the moment kits oh. that you really like would you rather just throw in the bin than wear oh i wouldn't say throw in the bin we've just got some new shirts at the club and i'm not a great fan of these new player fit shirts they don't do anything for the grassroots player they're um, <laughs> snug at best. Um, right, I was so looking, anything I, overly fitted. Yeah, yeah. I, we put one on. We had our new kit on this season, and allegedly it's a two XL. I put it on, and I thought, oh, this thing's going to have to be surgically removed. Um, <laughs> but it was it was a bit snug. But I was it, some of the away kit that you see these days, and you think, who the hell designed that? I'm not going to pick on any one country in particular because even some of the Welsh kits is um, just not to my taste but there's a South African one from about 18 months, two years ago. And this is sort of just minty green and white colour. And it's the most, oh, I just think it looks awful. It looks awful, top. Yeah, it's still their current away trip, I think. It's, it's still it? in rotation. I, I, haven't seen it for, 
I just remember seeing it. I think I'm not, it might have been in the um, one of the World Cups or they were playing certain, one of their autumn tours. I just thought, who the hell designed that? And then again, it's um, that famous, there was that purple one that England did for a while. And I just thought, no, thank you. Yeah, but I tell you what, though, Andy, I was out at the World Cup and it was very popular amongst the fans. I saw plenty of that South African uh, minty green right, away shirt in the stands. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm, sat know, in, I'm sat in a lime it, green t shirt from the club. And, it may not be everyone's taste. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was surprised me. I was I was very surprised to see so many supporters wearing that that shirt, especially when the classic Springboks jersey is just yeah. you know iconic, isn't it? Yeah, it is, and it is. And I say even like the Welsh kit, it's they're designing some stuff now. And the current even the current one, it, it just looks like a Man United football top. I mean, so let's have a bit of bit of heritage. I think the phrase probably is uh, you know look back to what it's all about. Yeah, heritage. That's a good way of saying it, actually. Yeah, because it, heritage can span generations. It can be sort of modern, but still, as long as it's got roots to the past, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, mate, we will bring this to a close now. But have you got any kind good. of closing thoughts or anything else you sort of want to say uh, before we round, round it up? I think the main thing is, and, you know, to any of the, anyone that's out there sat in the armchair watching or whatever, just get involved. Get up the club. It's the best thing you'll ever do, whether it, you know, being part of a club has been so important to me over the last few years, um, both for fitness and for my mental health. Um, get involved. And it may not be that you can't play for injury or whatever, but there's plenty of volunteering roles. Rugby clubs are run on volunteers. Um, and whether it's standing behind the bar, serving points or putting the kit out or helping or being on a committee or just doing some coaching, get involved. You know, we need co- we got um 300 odd kids up here on a Sunday morning. Um, they all need coaching. And it, if, you're, if you're a dad of a, you know, just offer you, they will snap your hand off. And if it's coaching, they'll give you the training. Just get involved is the main thing. Yeah. And especially on that coaching thing, I think people worry that they don't know enough about the game. They don't know no. what to do or what to say. But really, it's more about kid management it's more about herding cats a little bit especially at the younger age groups and the more people you've got doing that the better and it just it, it, it we got to say this are under six of the country now and a couple of our senior players um uh, they're a couple uh and they're both coaching uh, joe and amy and they did their first session this weekend and i went over and said you're right afterwards and they they said they loved it they looked like they needed a stiff drink i think <laughs> it was um <laughs> Like you say, it's herding cats, but the kids loved it, and hopefully, it'll get some of the other parents just that confidence to step forward. It is a bit of an ask, it's a bit of a commitment, but it's so rewarding. Yeah, but again, the more people that do it, the less of a commitment it needs to be because you've got more people to share the load. So, uh, yeah, there's lots going on there. Andy, if people want to get a hold of you or Mitch in Hampton, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, so through the club, we've got our Instagram site, Minch Rugby Official, um, and it's the same for the Facebook. Um, that's a whole club site, so that will cover all the age groups, all the way from six up to, like I say, 64. So we've got our oldest fella. Um, it's um, just get online, just Google Minch Hampton Rugby Club. We'll come up, um, drop us a message if you want to get involved in the game locally in, in Stroud area or even Gloucestershire. Um, just drop us a line. You're more than welcome. Yeah, and it, uh, for whatever reason, just people listening, get down to Mitch and Upton and go and look at their clubhouse because it's, I think it's quite inspirational, really, what you can do with a rugby clubhouse. Well, that's, that's Yeah, I think you're right there, mate, and that's very kind of you to say, um, you know, we are a members-only club technically, but if anyone's patting on a Saturday afternoon, the gates are open, there's a game on, come on in, say hello, have a beer and watch a bit of rugby. Yeah, 100%. Okay, people listening at home, everything we've mentioned will be in the show notes below, including loads of photos and links to that referees changing room video that I made. So make sure you get online and go and see all of it because it's, yeah, it's pretty inspirational as far as I'm concerned. And you can find all of that in one place and that's at amateurrugbypodcast.com. So Andy, it just leaves me to say thank you so much for your time today. It's been a real pleasure chatting. No, it's a pleasure being all my mate. And thanks for, thanks for um, keeping the amateur game going. Uh, you're very welcome, mate. Okay, there he goes, Andy Burford. Just uh, some great stories there about sticking in the game, staying in the game uh, as a, a sl- slightly older player, but also getting to play with his sons, which is just, uh, I'm sure, uh, a really wonderful thing to do. And then just the sort of thought about 
thinking outside the box. If you're doing a rugby club redevelopment, you know, I would really strongly recommend you go and take a look at Minch and see what they've done. You might not want to do exactly the same, but it might inspire you to do something that fits within your environment really well. Um, okay, if you enjoyed this podcast, you can do all the social media stuff. Uh, you can like, subscribe, all of that stuff. Make sure you get over to YouTube, though, to see the video of this one. But what I really like is if you mention it to someone in person the next time you're down your local rugby club. But until then, get out and play. <laughs>